Hello and welcome. Cerebus is a fascinating topic. It's a series that could have had a legacy current independent creators looked at for inspiration. It could have been a milestone achievement in the medium, one that was analyzed as thoroughly as Watchmen or Dark Knight or Mouse or any other popular example one can think of. It combined detailed visuals, complex stories and themes, possibly the best lettering ever done, and it contained experimental page layouts that matched the mood, tone, and pacing of the story. In short, it's a masterclass of graphic storytelling. But these details are hard to acknowledge. This is due to what the series became in the final half of its 300-issue run. Any recognition of the artistic achievement Cerebus represents seems to endorse the views and opinions expressed in that controversial portion of the series, or, worse yet, that one is excusing those opinions by overlooking them. Instead of any recognition, Cerebus is ignored or dismissed as the ramblings of a once-talented madman, one who caught a severe case of religion and anti-feminism. The point of this introduction is to be a lengthy disclaimer and acknowledgement that the overall series has problematic elements. These have been discussed in two prior videos. But this video looks at a time long before any controversy, when the series was just beginning and a new creative voice was developing. Originally, Cerebus began as a fanzine by Dave Sim, Denny Lubert, and various others. The fanzine was supposed to be named Cerberus, after the mythological monster, but Denny wrote the name down wrong and no one noticed until late into the process. Dave also suggested that they needed a name for a publishing company so the fanzine would sound somewhat official. Denny's sister contributed Aardvark Publishing, and Denny's brother contributed Vanaheim Publishing. The two were combined, and the name Aardvark Vanaheim Publishing was created. Sim designed a cartoon Aardvark mascot for the logo because, as he put it, I didn't know how to draw a Vanaheim. Thus Cerebus the Aardvark was born. Unfortunately, the fanzine never saw print. The publisher disappeared, taking their money and all of their material. At roughly the same time, Sim drew what would become the first page of Cerebus No. 1. He submitted that illustration and a proposal for an ongoing feature in the magazine Quack. The editor passed. Undaunted, Denny and Dave decided to give self-publishing a try, using the aardvark as the lead character in an ongoing series. The original plan was to do three issues and then decide whether to continue, depending on the success of the comic. The first five issues are a straightforward parody of the Roy Thomas and Barry Windsor Smith series, Conan the Barbarian. The conceit is that Conan is replaced by a marauding aardvark. The tone is light-hearted, but it is otherwise indistinguishable from an average issue of the Marvel series. The artwork itself directly emulates Windsor Smith's style from that period. It will take roughly a dozen issues before Sim starts to develop his own style, one that integrates these influences and becomes a unique voice. The first and second issues are basic adventure stories, where Cerebus finds himself using brute strength and skill against sorcery. At best, the character is established and slightly refined, but he doesn't stray too far from his Conan-esque roots. In the third issue, Cerebus meets Red Sophia, the well-endowed she-devil with a sword. Obviously, she is based on Red Sonia. While Red Sonia first appeared in Conan, Sim is paying tribute to the Frank Thorne version. In fact, Red Sophia's father, Henrot, is based on Thorn, who had a habit of cosplaying at conventions as a wizard. That is an interesting story unto itself. For those that missed it, Henrot is an anagram of Thorn. As an issue, it marks a noticeable improvement in all the story elements. The writing, pacing, artwork, and the lettering all start to gel together in a very coherent style. It may be slightly rough, but Sim's voice is becoming more refined. Using captions that fill in narrative details during moments with no dialogue will continue for some time, but Sim does start using them less and less as the series progresses. The fourth issue introduces a character that will recur many, many times. Elrod. Elrod is a parody of Michael Moorcock's Elric, although Sim had never read any of Moorcock's stories prior to doing the parody. He was only familiar with the two-issue appearance of Elric in the Conan comic. This unfamiliarity and Sim's sense of humor produced a unique character that was pompous and ineffective and spoke like the cartoon character Foghorn Leghorn. He is, quite simply, a walking, talking punchline, and he is basically fully formed from the first appearance. Incidentally, this issue also introduces Death. This character will be a deep dive reference later in the Mothers and Daughters portion of the series. He is not important whatsoever, but like most minor and supporting characters, he will get a conclusion during the aforementioned story. 
In the fifth issue, Sim parodies another character from the Robert E. Howard Library, Bran Mac Morn. Sim creates Bran Mac Muffin, the leader of an underground dwelling race, the Pigs. This race worships a statue that bears an uncanny resemblance to Cerebus. While this issue is mostly uneven and doesn't develop that revelation at all, this element becomes significant later on. There's not much to this issue, other than it establishes the running gag that Cerebus's fur smells disgusting when he's wet. The sixth issue introduces Jocka, one of the most significant characters of the series. In fact, she's one of the few characters that remained in the ongoing saga once all of the major plot points were wrapped up at the end of Mothers and Daughters, although her characterization at that point is questionable. In issue 6, Cerebus is drugged, becomes highly suggestible, and falls in love with Jocka. Meanwhile, two men try to manipulate Cerebus into revealing the location of some hidden treasure. Naturally, this plan goes awry, and comedic shenanigans ensue. Eventually, Cerebus snaps out of his drug-induced state and has no memory of Jocka or anything else that transpired. It is abrupt, but bittersweet nonetheless. In the seventh issue, Cerebus intends to break into the Black Sun Temple and loot its treasure. Along the way, he runs into Elrod, who decides to team up and join the Aardvark. What follows is a series of mistaken identity scenes involving a cult that worship an Aardvark god. At this point, a major story element, one that somewhat defines the series, emerges to the forefront. Cerebus has a clear, usually simplistic goal. However, it's the people around him and their interference that prevent him from achieving that goal. His single-minded tunnel vision continually forces him to adapt to unforeseen complications. Due to this lack of foresight, Cerebus ends up with nothing for his efforts. Much like the fifth issue, the seventh issue gently suggested that Nardvark is a source of worship. They are rare, magical beings worthy of devotion. At this point, Sim didn't have a long-term plan for the series, so this plot beat is used for comedic purposes. But it is noteworthy texture that he'll return to in the future. Issues 8 and 9 are quite interesting in hindsight. While not intentional, they contain many of the major plot points that would be explored in high society and church and state. Delusional and poisoned, Cerebus is captured by the Conniptions and manipulated into becoming their king. Cerebus begrudgingly accepts this position, seeing the potential to exploit the situation and become wealthy. He leads the Conniptions to Imesh, a city he intends to capture and loot. He enters the city alone and discovers the entire population are fixated on erecting a large, bizarre structure. The city is controlled by Kakor, a madman who wants to protect the world from an invasion of Venusians. Cerebus is run through a gauntlet where he confronts Kakor at the end. However, Kakor is merely delaying Cerebus. He's been wasting his time to ensure the troops Cerebus brought with him are all dead from poison. Cerebus is allowed to leave with nothing as his reward. He has no gold, no power, and no one to command. Like in high society, Cerebus is manipulated into becoming a figurehead. On both occasions, he can leave if he chooses, but his greed keeps him in place. Kakor uses a highly addictive drug called Buzz to get the city of Imesh to build his protective structure. In church and state, Cerebus uses religious fervor, or the opiate of the masses, to amass gold and to build a structure to forge a globe that will allow him to ascend. The parallels aren't exact, but the intent is rather similar. These two issues resemble a loose blueprint of the theme Sim will explore between issues 26 to 112, 113. Issue 10 contains the return of Red Sophia. It's a relatively straightforward heist story, where Cerebus pulls a double cross and actually ends up with the treasure they were after. Notably, Red Sophia drops out of the story until Church and State. Even then, as a character, she remains mostly undeveloped and used as a complication in Cerebus's life. Mind you, this is basically true of all the characters Cerebus encounters. Other characters are complications that sit between Cerebus and his goals. The next two issues introduce another significant character in the Cerebus saga. The Delusional Cockroach. The Cockroach begins as a Batman parody. He's a deranged individual who stalks the streets at night, accusing strangers of killing his parents and then robbing them of their gold. As Cerebus discovers, the Cockroach has been doing this for three decades and he has amassed a fortune in stolen gold. Naturally, Cerebus attempts to acquire these riches. Unfortunately, Elrod makes an appearance and puts a wrinkle in Cerebus's plans. As per usual, Cerebus ends up with nothing for his efforts. Behind the scenes, there was an equally significant development. It was at this time that Dave Sim had his, quote, nervous breakdown, unquote. The official reasoning was due to the stress of producing two issues back-to-back. -back. 
In actuality, as Sim would reveal years later, he decided to drop LSD for a week while creating the comic. This experiment, along with the various pressures of being a self-publisher, caused him to collapse and be hospitalized. It was during this hospital stay that Sim decided the series would be 300 issues long and it would conclude with the death of the main character. He also decided to begin publishing the series monthly instead of bi-monthly. The next year or so of the title can be viewed as Sim experimenting with longer, more complex, and interconnected plots. During this time, the series would become more successful and renowned. The writing and artwork sharpened, and Sim began forecasting the shape of the series that would be seen in the years to come. With that said, the 13th issue feels a bit like a filler story. Cerebus encounters the sorcerer, Necros the Ha 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 Ma. It is rather amusing, and Necros will have a role during Church and State, but it's mostly another gentle parody of superheroes, specifically the Thing from Fantastic Four. As a bridge between this story and the next, Sim produced a weekly, one-page story for the Comic Buyer's Guide. Overall, it's a homage to Hal Foster's long-running Prince Valiant comic strip. But, more importantly, it's the debut of Lord Julius, and it explains how this important figure was introduced to Cerebus. Not to mention, it provides Lord Julius's motivation to suddenly hire Cerebus. This is a context that's missing from the ensuing storyline. As Sim would later note, this story amounted to a free ad every week in that trade newspaper. The timing was perfect, as Sim was about to start a story with massive appeal. In terms of importance, the next three issues, known as the Paul New Trilogy, are rather significant. While there had been issues that were connected, this was the first long-form, continuous story. It's the point where the story starts to build on the parts that occurred before it. That is, it adopts a noticeable continuity. The narrative thread of the entire remaining series begins here. Also, Serpus had mainly been comedic, with a few light touches of irony and drama. But the writing takes a slightly abrupt but organic turn into satire during this trilogy. A lot of that has to do with basing Lord Julius on the classic, sharp-witted comedian Groucho Marx. Within the absurdity of the political arena, Groucho's voice is a perfect fit, and Sim translates that voice expertly onto the comic book page. While other characters may be more complex, with grounded or relatable motivations, Lord Julius and his nonchalant absurdity is the perfect foil to Cerebus's grim determination. For those that like trivia, Julius is Groucho's actual first name, thus Lord Julius. The story itself involves an assassination plot to kill Lord Julius during a festival. Cerebus is hired to prevent that from happening. After this trilogy, Cerebus takes his earned gold and leaves Palnu. The next four issues are another continuous plot. Cerebus joins a group of barbarians who intend to attack and occupy Palnu. Along the way, Sim takes the time to parody one final Robert E. Howard creation, Kroll the Conqueror. Henrot and a magical manifestation of Red Sophia also appear. Unfortunately, the plot comes to an abrupt conclusion when Serapis is drugged and abducted. However, one very important element is established. This is the first Mind Games chapter. Mind Games will be a recurring event throughout the series. In essence, Serapis goes comatose and his consciousness is able to tap into a higher plane of existence, or sphere, where he's able to communicate with others. This concept will evolve through the series and become far more abstract, with Serapis having surreal visions that are open to interpretation. In this first chapter, Cerebus pits Cyrenists and Illusionists against one another. For the first time, Cerebus has to rely on his wits rather than his brute strength to get himself out of a situation. While he has been shown to be resourceful in the past, this issue highlights the fact that he can think his way out of a situation, but he prefers a more direct, violent solution because it's far easier than having to think. Two more interesting bits about this part. If the entire issue is taken apart, it can be reassembled into a larger Cerebus poster. More to the point, when Cerebus is within the grey areas, he speaks to the illusionists. When he's in the black portions, he talks to the Cyrenists. As a narrative experiment, it works and flows rather well. It's not always as organic as one might hope, but it does the trick more often than not. As mentioned a moment ago, the story abruptly ends, and Cerebus wakes up, completely removed from the war, in another part of the world. It's not a satisfying resolution whatsoever, and reads like a creative misstep. Regardless, the next two issues bring back the Cockroach and Elrod, who are trying to help a revolutionary. Issue 21 introduces Weishaupt, another key figure who will disappear into the background until later in the series, although his influence seems to be present even though he is not. Overall, these two issues are a parody of Captain America, his sidekick Bucky, Dead Man, and fierce patriotism and propaganda. It's a bit of a mixed bag of cynicism and comedy. For the most part, from this point forward, the Cockroach and Elrod will be joined at the hip.
When you see one, the other is somewhere nearby. As a comedy team, they do tend to play well off of each other. As if attempting to get all parody characters out of the way before he launches into an epic story, the final three issues of this volume are an odd mix of elements. It begins as a homage to the Clint Eastwood movie, The Beguiled. Then it transitions into an all-girl version of the X-Men, where Professor X is a sorcerer researching how to create an apocalypse beast. From there, it becomes a bizarre parody of Man-Thing and Swamp-Thing. While these creations will appear later in Church and State, this three-issue arc is somewhat forgettable. In part, that may be because it's quiet and isolated. Cerebus is injured and mostly inactive, acting as an observer rather than a participant. As a side note, on this final page, Cerebus acquires a MacGuffin off-panel that becomes relevant at the end of High Society. In hindsight, as suggested a moment ago, these issues also feel like a creator clearing away the mental parody debris in order to focus on more serious work. Certainly, the Cockroach will continue to be an ever-changing character that parodies a variety of superheroes, and there will be many, many other characters based on real people, but they won't be straightforward parodies. Their usage isn't to mock a person or the quirks of their character, but to utilize their public persona because it fits the needs of the story. At best, one could suggest the issues between the Paul New Trilogy and High Society establish background foundational elements. The world is in a state of unrest. Barbarian hordes are on the move, conquering weaker territories. Ideologies bicker amongst themselves and vie for power. The ruling class maintain their status with money and slight ambivalence towards the lower classes. Everyone is ambitious and looking for the one thing that will assert their dominance and control in this uneasy world. Everyone needs someone like Cerebus to unify and galvanize their cause. This is the atmosphere leading into the grand two-year storyline of high society. In the end, the first 25 issues of Cerebus, collected in one edition, Cerebus the Barbarian, are exactly what one would expect from a slightly inexperienced creator at the beginning of their career. There are rough bits, and not everything works as intended, but any errors or missteps are easy to overlook. What makes this volume somewhat unique is the sense of playfulness and fun, not to mention humility and a sincere effort by the creator to improve. The series would take years to become stable and successful, and Sim uses that time to establish his voice. Put another way, Sim doesn't take his audience for granted, as it appears he would later in the series, and each issue is an attempt to maintain their continued support. Speaking of support, support this channel. Subscribe, like, and comment if you want. I don't know, whatever you want to do. I don't want to pressure you into anything. Just do what feels right. You know, I hope that's positive. It should be positive. I'm pretty great, I, I think, maybe. Possibly. Maybe your opinion differs. It shouldn't. But if it does, that's okay. Just, you know, do what comes natural.